This is a resource of Just Loving God. Heaven, Session 1, Part A, Living in Eternity Today. So I've entitled this sermon, Living in Eternity Today. And I want you to come away with a real vision of eternity. And I want you to see it so clearly. I want God to reveal it to you so clearly that your heart is literally caught away. That your affections and love is caught away to the king of that place when you see what he has prepared for you. When we look at a book like Ecclesiastes, we see an author in a state of mind where he has no eternal perspective. If you think of Ecclesiastes, it's all about now. It's all about the the drudgery of life, the fact that I can't even eat what I grow, can't enjoy the money that I earn. Sounds like a a guy with holes in his purse, with holes in his, his jar of joy. So we want to do the opposite. We want to set our minds on things above. We will never live as God intends us to live unless we have an eternal perspective. We will simply live attached to this world. That's why we've been given eyes of faith, so that we can behold that place. This will transform your entire life, will transform your Bible reading. Why? Because you'll read with a view to his great master plan. You'll understand the great arc of redemptive history. It'll change your prayer life. Why? Because you'll be praying to the God who guarantees your inheritance, to the God who will be rewarding you. It'll change your soul winning because what you're actually doing is winning future friends. You're winning future fellowship. You're rejoicing God's heart by populating that place. You're understanding the rewards and the treasures that you are amassing as you soul win. Your joy will be transformed because no longer will there be any condemnation. There will be no fear of punishment because you'll understand the rewards that he has for those who believe on his name. It'll change the way you handle money and your resources on this temporal orb. Why? Because you'll be sending it on ahead. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. You'll understand that you will be eternally harvesting what you sow here. This is why you need an eternal vision to be able to live here and now as God intends you to live. So I wanna give you some facts about, quotes heaven. But first, before I do that, I wanna talk about resurrection, which the Bible says must precede heaven. So let's just look at resurrection and get clear on that. Every single human being, man, woman, and child who's ever lived, whoever will live, will be resurrected without exception, every single one. Daniel 12, verse two. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the Bible talks about two resurrections. Let's look at the first resurrection. Revelation 20, verse four and five and six. It talks about a first resurrection of believers. They are described as blessed and holy, those ones who are resurrected. The second death, which is the lake of fire, mentioned in Revelation 20, 14, has no power over these people. The first resurrection is thus the raising of all believers. It corresponds with Jesus' teaching on the resurrection of the just in Luke 14, and the resurrection of life in John 5 that he talks about. The first resurrection seems to have various stages. The first stage, of course, is Jesus as the first fruits of all believers' resurrections. That's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. Then the resurrection of the dead in Christ will follow. That's us. And this will happen at the Lord's return. This is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. And then it does appear that there'll be a resurrection of the martyrs at the end of a tribulation period. This is mentioned in Revelation 20 verse four. So that all seems to be part of this first resurrection of the righteous. But then there's the second resurrection. Revelation 20, verse 12 and 13, they talk about the wicked being judged at the great white throne. Some think this is merged with all the judgments that are mentioned in scripture. I think potentially this is a separate judgment just for the wicked, but I can't be dogmatic about that. But it certainly is right before the casting of the wicked into the lake of fire. So the second resurrection, therefore, is the raising of all unbelievers, and it's connected to the second death. This corresponds with Jesus' teaching, the resurrection of damnation, 
again in John chapter 5. Now, in between these two resurrections, it appears, and this is my personal view, that there is a literal millennium or thousand-year rule of Christ on this physical earth. So this appears to be between the two resurrections. And the righteous are raised in this first resurrection to reign with Christ a thousand years, Revelation 20 verse four says. But the rest of the dead, that's the wicked, lived not again until the thousand years were finished. That's verse five of Revelation 20. And then it appears too that the earth is gonna be resurrected from its state of groaning, if you like, just as our bodies will be. This is talked about in Romans chapter eight, uh, amongst other places. So there is definitely a resurrected state after death. So let's turn to heaven in quotes. What is, quotes, heaven? Well, obviously it's not Dante's Divine Comedy where he uh, made this ridiculous poem and one section of it is called Paradiso, which of course corresponds with paradise. It's obviously not what Michelangelo painted on the Sistine Chapel ceiling with a bunch of fat little cupids flying around with bows and arrows. So what is heaven? 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And then verse 10, people miss out. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. And what he's revealed to us is that there are going to be incredible rewards. Incredible. There will be rewards and treasures and glories and joys that you cannot imagine. But he's just begun to reveal these things to us. Now, most people think that uh, heaven is just a place where Christians go when they die. That's what they, that's what they think. They go to heaven and they just stay there forever. Well, sorry to disappoint you, but that's not what the Bible says. The phrase go to heaven or going to heaven doesn't even appear in the Bible. Not once, it's just a thing we say. Don't worry, I'm not leaving you high and dry. I think it's probably better to describe or to define heaven as the dwelling place of God and the location of his ruling throne. So that I think is probably more accurate to describe as heaven. And I'm just gonna throw in another thing here for you as well, that the present pre-resurrection heaven, the existing pre-resurrection heaven, and the future post-resurrection heaven are in completely different locations. So let's look at the current heaven, otherwise known, I think, as paradise. Jesus said to the thief on the cross next to him, he said, this day will you be with me in paradise in Luke 23. And then Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about a man he knew once, clearly talking of himself, who was caught away to the third heaven. And he then immediately calls it paradise. So I think this is the same place Jesus was talking about. And it's interesting actually, just as an aside, that that word caught up that Paul uses there is the same word used in 1 Thessalonians chapter four for the catching away or the rapture of the church. Well, one thing we know about this place, this paradise, this heaven, is that we will be in the presence of Christ. That's why it's paradise. In John 14, verse three, Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So this is paradise. This is what we have generally called heaven. This is what I'm saying is the current pre resurrection heaven. So we've no idea where this heaven is, except that it is up. It's not down. It's not sideways. It's up. That's all we know. It's still up, even if you're Australian. And of course, this current heaven is free from sin. Naturally, it's free from suffering. It is, as Psalm 1611 says, in your presence is fullness of joy. Now, will we have temporary physical bodies there? I've no idea. Uh, I think it would be conjecture to say we would. We might be loaned some kind of temporary physical form. I've no idea. But certainly we're not yet united with our original body, the us. Because without this, we're not fully human as God made us. We're not just spirits. Will we be able to recognize each other there and loved ones in this current heaven? I think so. The Bible has no indication anywhere of some kind of memory wipe happening when we get there. 
This isn't total recall <laughs> gone wrong. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says of the deceased that we should comfort one another with these words about the coming, the return of the Lord to catch us away. Well, it wouldn't be any comfort if we weren't going to see them, would it? So I suspect we will definitely see them. And of course, the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration recognized Moses and Elijah, who they put, couldn't possibly have known. So somehow from this state emanates who you are and other believers know who you are. So how we wouldn't recognize our loved ones and friends and family is beyond me. I suspect we absolutely will. So encourage one another with these words. Okay, so what about the future? Quotes, heaven. Well, the location of this will move to a place described by Revelation chapters 21 and 22. These chapters clearly locate the bride of Christ and the city of God on the new earth. Not up in the sky, on the new earth. So what we have now is therefore an intermediate heaven. We have an intermediate state of the believers who are there. But the good news about this intermediate state is that, as Paul says, it's far better, or it's better by far in Philippians chapter 1 to go there. But it's not our final destination. So to talk about dying and going to heaven and then we'd be there forever is not accurate. So just get that clear. One thing about this future heaven is, of course, that the Trinity is dwelling there. And, of course, Christ will be eternally, eternally incarnate in this place. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 3 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And jumping forward a bit, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Jump on a bit. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Isn't that glorious? This is a difference. This is not quite what we have now. Yes, he's Emmanuel. Yes, he is God with us. But there he will be physically living with us in the same city. So I think it's better to call it the new earth and the new heaven, uh, maybe, than just heaven. Revelation 22, verse 1. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the new Jerusalem, on the new earth. It will actually and finally be heaven on earth. All these pop songs and ridiculous things that we hear, this will actually be heaven on earth. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, verse 13, according to his promise, this is certain, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. According to his promise, we're waiting. Okay, so let's look at this new earth. I think it's beautiful that the entirety of redemptive history from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation is bookended by this, these two bookends. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And at the very end, it says, he will remake the heavens and the earth. It's absolutely amazing. Let's look at a few scriptures on this. Revelation 21.5, behold, I make all things new. This is his promise. Psalm 102, 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture or clothing. Shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. I'd like to throw in a bit of King James here and there. Here's a bit more. Isaiah 51, 6. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says this, heaven and earth shall pass away, or literally are passing away, but my words shall not pass away. Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And so long before entropy, or the second law of thermodynamics, which I don't understand, but I read about it, destroys everything or collapses this universe, God's going to intervene. The creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption 
into the glorious liberty of the children of God, Romans 8, 21. That's what's gonna happen. The creation is gonna be delivered into this glorious liberty. Okay, so is it gonna be a different earth and a different heavens, a brand new one? Or will it be the same old one renewed? Well, I think it will be the latter. I think it will be the same heaven and earth renewed. And I'll give you my biblical argument for that. It won't have a sea. There won't be oceans and the new earth. I don't know why. Maybe there's too many saved people, so we need the land space. I don't know. <laughs> Could be. Or maybe they boiled dry when God purified it, and it's just these big, amazing valleys. I have no idea. What happened to the whales? I don't know. He knows. I trust him. Here's what he says. He doesn't say, I'm making new everything. He says, I'm making everything new. And I think that's a difference. You see, he's a redeemer. What does a redeemer do? Does he destroy the object of his redemption and then make a new thing? No. He takes the corrupted, broken thing and he redeems it, restores it. That's what he does. So I think, just judging by God's character and nature, that he won't completely start from nothing again. And the first law of thermodynamics says that all energy and matter is conserved. You can't destroy it. You can't get rid of it. You can blow it up. You can, like, smoke it. You can drill it. You can explode it, you can do anything you like with it, but it's, the energy's still there. It's just in a different form. The, the matter's still there, just in a different form. You can't get rid of it. So that's an observation that has been made about this cosmos, and God doesn't seem to contradict that. In Psalm 78, 69, it says, he built his sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth which he hath established forever. Interesting. So maybe there is an atomic disintegration of everything, maintaining all the atomic particles, cleansing them, purifying them, and then in this glorious act of atomic integration, this glorious new act of creation, he renews all of it into a new earth and a new heavens. I don't know, but I do like to allow myself a little license to imagine. 2 Peter 3.10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? It's quite sobering this, the thought that every single galaxy will be exploded with a loud roar. I think that's a slight understatement. A loud roar, I think, I can't comprehend what that will sound like. But Peter seems to be suggesting there's gonna be some cataclysmic event. But I think it's like the resurrection of our bodies. Yes, our bodies are, quotes, destroyed. They fall into the ground and they rot and decompose away. And yet those same bodies are gonna be resurrected. Jesus didn't uh, have a brand new body. His earthly body wasn't just left in the tomb and he gets a brand new body. No, it's the same body. So I suspect it will be the same for the earth. I think there's continuation of creation and continuation of our bodies. Maybe it's like the metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a butterfly. Totally different and yet the same. Isaiah 65, 17 says, look, I am ready to create new heavens and a new earth. It's gonna happen. So, now I want to explode your imaginations. I want to think and explore what this new earth and these new heavens might be like. Well, I think from all that I've read in scripture that it'll be everything that you have ever imagined. It will be everything that's ever caught your breath. It's everything that you've ever loved. It's everything that you've ever relaxed in. It's everything you've ever enjoyed. It's everything you've derived pleasure from in this beautiful world. It's anything you've ever found fulfillment in, like a wonderful job or some activity. It's everything you've ever found in the best of friendships, multiplied by infinity. <laughs> Romans 8, it seems to show us that there's a correspondence between the old earth and the new earth, and between our old bodies and our new bodies. It's, it's a glorious place. C.S. Lewis, I think, wrote something very telling in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He said, wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, 
we shall have spring again. I think it's Genesis 1 all over again, but way better. It's not discarded, I think, but saved. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is his nature, and this creation is lost in the curse. It was very good then, and I wonder how he'll describe it in the future. Very, very good? I don't know. Maybe there won't be enough berries. I think it's going to be the marriage of heaven and earth for the very first time. It's going to be the marriage of Christ and his church, for sure. This heavenly city will come down, it says, Revelation 21, 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Often it's called New Jerusalem or the tabernacle of God or the holy city or the city of God or the celestial city or the city four square or the heavenly Jerusalem. It's mentioned in Galatians 4 and Hebrews 11, 12 and 13. This is the same city that Abraham was looking for, whose builder and architect is God. It's the same city we look for. It's a city of dazzling beauty. It's got 12 giant pearls for gates. It's got foundations made of such beauty and such value that John was at a loss to describe them. All he could do was just compare them to earthly jewels. I think he was probably shaking his head as his quill scratched across that vellum. I can't express this, God, what I've just seen. It's also huge. It's nearly 1,400 cubic miles. And guess what? You're a citizen. You actually have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. 1 Peter 1, verse 4. This will be the final consummation of all things. This is the summation. You can imagine the longest equation you could ever see. And right at the end is the, is the answer, is the summation, is the solution to all. That's Christ. Ephesians 1, verse 8. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Do you see, he is the great algorithm of history's summation. So what else is this place gonna be like? This new earth and new heavens? Well, there's no curse. Oh, we can't even imagine what no curse is like, can we? Revelation 22, three, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. There won't be any conflict. There'll be no weeds to dig up. There'll be no death. There'll be no spiders. Well, there might be spiders, but they won't have webs to kill anything. There won't be carnivores. There won't be disease. There will be no natural disasters that kill and hurt and maim. Time will no longer be your enemy. You say, well, hang on a minute. I thought there wasn't going to be time in heaven. Well, that's why I'm encouraging you to rename this the new earth and the new heaven, because there absolutely will be time. Revelation 22, 2 says, describes the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. Oh, hang on a minute. Revelation 6, verse 10, talks about the saints in heaven who keep asking, how long until Christ's judgment comes on the wicked? It's like they're waiting. Paul spoke of the ages to come. Sounds like time to me. Suddenly time will become your friend instead of a burden. Imagine enjoying pleasure without the sensation of the passage of time. That's not really pleasure. It's the very fact that it lasts that is wonderful. There's no more waiting for a better time in this place. There's no more waiting for an answered prayer in this place. There's no need for healing or help. You see, time isn't the problem. It's never been the problem. Sin and the curse are the problem. Death is the problem. You notice that time came before sin. Time came before the curse. Time isn't the problem. Well, what else about this place? Well, it's a physical world and there will be physical people on it just like now, no different, except very different. 
They'll be feasting. They'll be working. They'll be playing. They'll be singing. They'll be laughter. They'll be bustle. This evil Greek philosophical notion perpetrated by Plato and others that the physical world is not actually reality is utterly false. Or this idea, this dualistic idea that the physical realm is evil and only the spiritual realm is, is good and that we're somehow like hermit crabs. We're actually just a spirit. We just inhabit this shell of a, this husk thing, which is actually not us at all. Absolute false lie. And unfortunately, this has seeped into the word faith movement. They brought this in. We're just a spirit inhabiting a body. False. That is a heresy. Eternity will be physical. That's the eternal state of the saved. Revelation 22, 3. There will be human activity. It will be everywhere. It will be always, and it will be throughout the whole of this new earth. How do we know that? It says his servants will serve him. Well, what are they doing? I don't know. They're serving him. Well, he obviously wants things done. So we'll be doing it. This is a physical world with physical people. So I suspect we will be eating and drinking. 1 Timothy 6, 17. It says he richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Well, if he richly provides everything for our enjoyment now, like chocolate or coffee, then I suspect the everything will be a new everything there. Paul again says, everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. 1 Timothy 4. So why would there not be chocolate? There, there can't not be chocolate. <laughs> why would there not be coffee? Why would there not be fruit juice? Isaiah 25, 6 says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. That's a time yet to come. There's probably going to be fruit to pick and eat. There was in Eden. Why would there not be in the new Eden? And imagine the fruit juice we could squeeze from those things. Imagine what that's going to taste like. And imagine this, you can drink as much as you like and you won't get fat. <laughs> there won't be allergies. There won't be health issues. There will not be addictions. There will be no health risks from drinking that new wine in that new kingdom. Well, what else in this physical world? I think there'll be weather. Why not? Elihu rightly says in the book of Job, chapter 37, that lightning, thunder, rain, and snow all declare God's greatness. He's right. They do. Why would the new earth have no weather? How about seasons? Why not? You say, well, they can't be autumn because that's when things die. I don't know. Genesis 8, 22. As long as the earth endures, notice, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Now, it does say that there will be no night in that place. Now, whether that's just in the New Jerusalem or on the whole of the earth, I don't know. So there's no death, but maybe God could create cycles of color on the trees just for our enjoyment. I like to imagine. I don't know. What else about this new earth and these new heavens? Well, they'll be beautiful. That's a fact. The whole earth will be a recreation of Eden or the Garden of God as it's known. It'll be watered by the fountain of living waters that flows from beneath the throne. This is God himself. He is the fountain of living waters. The one that men so often ignore and carve out for themselves cisterns that can't hold any water. I don't come to that fountain, but this fountain will water this beautiful place. This place will be bursting with color and life and sounds and light. And I'm sure waterfalls and lakes this river is even prophesied in Psalm 46, 4. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. I suspect there'll be woodlands and mountains and glorious skies and wind caressing our cheeks. I think there might well be thunder and lightning. Jeremiah 10, 13 says, he makes lightning for the rain. He brings out the wind from his storehouses. If God glories in that now, why not then? It won't zap anyone. It won't start fires and destroy anything. But why would he not rumble 
They mistook the Father's voice for thunder when Jesus was on the earth. Imagine the breathtaking views. Imagine the beautiful experiences you will have in this new earth and these new heavens. Imagine the creatures. Imagine all humanity laboring together to co-rule creation as they were always intended to do, instead of destroying it. And the glory of the temple in the New Jerusalem will bathe this new earth in a glory. All nations will bask in the power of the resurrected Christ. God's own presence will saturate every square centimeter of this creation. So what else about this new earth and new heavens? Well, I think there'll be work, as I mentioned. Genesis 2, 5, Adam was always to work the earth, notice. That's why he's created. Before sin, work isn't a curse. Imagine work that is maximally productive, that is maximally enjoyable and fulfilling and wonderful. This work, I think, will be important to God and it will be fulfilling for us. Well, what else about this place? Well, we will have dominion over the earth as we were meant to. Genesis 1, created to rule. That was what man was there to do. And I think we will do the same, but this time, finally, righteous. Now, some of you may say, oh, that sounds scary. I'm not sure I could rule anything. Well, don't worry. You will have the abilities because you will be glorified. It'll be completely different. Don't even make a comparison to now. Don't make a comparison to your insecurities now and here because you will not be like that there. What else about this place? Well, there'll be unity. Instead of just the, the holy land of Israel, there'll be a holy world. There'll be one new church, one new body through the death of Christ. The, the Jew and the Gentile made one, the believing Jew and the believing Gentile made one in Christ. Every race and tribe and tongue and kindred and people together in unity. Every nation, because there will be nations, I'm sure, blessed just as God covenanted with Abraham through Christ. And all of that started with the ministry of Jesus and it spread and that early church took it out from the old Jerusalem and spread. And then we continue the Great Commission to populate the new earth. It's just spreading outwards and outwards and outwards like a ripple effect. Well, what else about this place? I think there'll be childlikeness. I think Jesus loved children so much and he said, you can't even see this place unless you're like a child, let alone go there. I think we will be eternally childlike. I think we will be inquisitive. What's that for? What does that do? Why is it like that? Lord, what, what, why, why did you make it that way? Why is it that color? Why couldn't it be this color? And I'm sure he'll answer all our questions. Or he might just say, because, like I did with my kids. <laughs> I think we'll ever be learning. I think we'll ever be maturing into the knowledge of God. I think we'll be wanting to hear stories. Who here does not like stories? Exactly. Nobody. We are built to listen to stories. I'm telling you, there's going to be stories on the new earth. There will be billions and billions of saints that you can sit down with and hear their story. Billions. And there will be, of course, the Lamb and the Father of lights and the wondrous Holy Spirit. And I will ask for some stories. <laughs> so what else about this place? Well, will there be travel? Will there be exploration? Why not? He made the original earth, this earth, and then he planted a garden just over here, but he said, cultivate the whole world, Adam. Name all the creatures. They weren't all huddled in this tiny little garden. So yes, I suspect there will be travel and exploration. Why are there streets of gold if we're not meant to walk on them? He said, well, you're meant to drive on streets. Maybe, but if we can teleport, why would we need cars? They'll be lying down, they'll be rising up, they'll be dancing, they'll be singing. I suspect we'll be traveling and exploring to go and visit new friends and old friends. Luke 16, verse nine, Jesus said this. He said, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your 
possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. A very strange parable, this one. But I think what it means is, use the unrighteous mammon, the money of this world, to sow into the eternal kingdom, to, to win souls, to make friends in eternity, and they will welcome you into eternal habitations. Teleporting? I think so. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 says that we have two types of body, one a natural and one spiritual, and yet physical, just not mortal anymore. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. It's not subject to the old laws of physics. Our immortal bodies will become like his, it says in 1 John 3, 2. What about space travel? Why on earth did God make space? I think maybe there are endless wonders and endless beauties to discover. Maybe that's why the universe is apparently infinite. You ask a smattering of whatever they are, astrophysicists, probably half of them will say, yeah, I think it's infinite. The other half will say, I don't know. See, he has eternal purposes. He made it that way now for a reason that he knows. And when it's without a curse, who knows what will be. Remember it says a new earth and a new heavens. Not new heaven, but new heavens. I think that's referring to the universe. So new heavens, space. One thing we know about it, it's gonna be very bright. There's no night and it says there's no need for the sun. It doesn't necessarily mean there is no sun, it just means there's no need for a sun. There's no need for sunglasses either because you'll have glorified eyeballs. Revelation 21, 23. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Revelation 22, 5. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. He's so bright that maybe the sun will just look like the moon does now. Maybe so bright that the, the moon will not even be visible from the New Jerusalem. I don't know. And again, the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21, Revelation 22. They seem to restore God as the light source, just as he was, look at this, in Genesis 1. Before he made the sun and the moon, he said, let there be light. So he was the light of that place, and he will be the light of that place to come. I think maybe we'll have a better view of the stars and the planets with our glorified eyes. Maybe they won't be in need of an atmosphere or oxygen to to refract or whatever it does, it distorts light from a distance. You certainly won't get sunburn, but I think you'll be able to see better. You'll probably be able to look and see the Milky Way, the new Milky Way restored. Will we see sunsets and sunrises? Maybe. Psalm 19 verse one says that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So why not in a restored heavens? restored from the curse. If this is what the cursed heavens look like, what on earth will the uncursed heavens look like? Surely it'll be better. The sheer scale of the universe glorifies God. I am in awe when I think of it. Do you know, to get to the nearest galaxy, Andromeda, at the speed of light would take us 20 million years. And that's just the first of billions of galaxies, maybe more. We have no idea. I think the vastness of space he's done for a reason. Maybe we'll travel to other planets to view distant sunsets. I don't know, why not? Imagine creativity and science and inventing with glorified cognition. He, he made us for this under the curse. He delights in our discoveries of his world and his universe. Hmm. Imagine glorified minds building telescopes and flying machines and rockets. Maybe we won't need them. Imagine the music and the art. Imagine being perfectly in God's image with glorified minds and bodies. I can only imagine what that music would sound like. There have been times when I've been transported by music just gloriously transported. And that is literally dust compared to what will be there. I think this place will also have never-ending pleasure. 
Of course, it will have never-ending life. There'll be pleasures forevermore, Psalm 16 says. J.I. Packer says, hearts on earth say in the course of a joyful experience, I don't want this ever to end, but it in in invariably does. The hearts of those in heaven say, I want this to go on forever, and it will. There can be no better news than this. Revelation 22, 1, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. Just pleasures, just life eternal. We can eat any time we want from this tree. Glorious. Well, what about animals then? I think this place will definitely have animals. Isaiah 11, Isaiah 65 talk about multiple animals. Romans 8, 22 says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. That must include the animals. Remember, animals predated the curse. They predated sin. Animals aren't a problem. Animals are wonderful. Will he bring back extinct animals? I don't know, maybe. Maybe we're, we'll be walking around with the T-Rex. Maybe the animals will be able to talk. Maybe the curse removed that level of cognition from animals for a good reason. If you love animals, then I think quite possibly you'll get to steward and care for some animals. What else about this place? Well, you'll be just like Jesus. But even better than that, you will be with Jesus. This is the fulfillment of the original calling on Adam and Eve. He will be reigning on his throne next to Father. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, and I bet you've never noticed this little phrase in the middle of this. Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the new world. And he didn't mean America. <laughs> and God will live with us physically. Revelation 21, three. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. This is a glorious truth. Revelation 21, 22. And I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. There's no Holy of Holies anymore because all of the universe is the Holy of Holies now. There's a new Jerusalem, finally ruled by a righteous king of the lineage of David, whose kingdom continues forever and ever. And of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. And this should make us rejoice, all of this here and now. This should change our lives because this isn't very far away. This is close, this is soon. Here's a promise for you, Revelation 21, four. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And I've got a prophecy for you, Acts 3.21. This is uh, Peter talking. This is speaking of Jesus. Whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So even Peter understood this right on Pentecost. There's coming a time for the restoring of all things. And joyful, we're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2. Randy Alcorn says this, he says, the doctrine of new heaven and new earth is not simply about future happiness. It's central to our present happiness. The forever that awaits us should color our lives now. We should daily backload eternity's joys into our present experience. So live for that age, live for that place. Live for the king of that place and live with the joy of that place and tell everyone about the age to come. 
So now I'm going to just break us into groups. I want you to talk to each other about the age to come. I want you to talk about insights or thoughts or mind explosions that you've had. I want you to discuss it. Have fun. So I'll give you 12 minutes of fun. Time is still our enemy. <laughs> so you've got 12 minutes of fun to discuss the new earth and the new heavens. This is the end of part one of two.